The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericahealth.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, I'm welcoming Michelle Perro, who is a veteran pediatrician with over 35 years of experience in, cu- in acute and integrative medicine, and Vince Ann Adams, who is a professor and vice chair of medical anthropology in the Department of Anthropology, History, and Social Medicine at the University of California. Today, we are discussing their book, What's Making Our Children Sick? How Industrial Food is Causing an Epidemic of Chronic Illness and What Parents and Doctors Can Do About It. So welcome to the show, ladies. Thank you, and good morning. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you so, for having us. So um, what what got you involved in writing this book together? Do you want to start, um, Michelle? I must start. Well, what, is, what happened, Rebecca, was, I, as you mentioned, I was a practicing pediatrician in acute care medicine. I was a pediatric emergency physician at a children's hospital here. And my own son got sick, um, and I began a journey and foray into um, homeopathics and integrative medicine. And that was 24, almost 24 years ago. (laughs) And then through that journey, I got involved with pesticide spraying and stopping the pesticide spray through a group of moms, and one of them was my patient's mom, and she needed a pediatrician. And so that entered me into this world of pesticides and food and genetic modification through my interaction with this group of incredible, well-informed women. And so it was through that relationship that I started understanding this relationship about food and GMOs. Through that connection, I read Jeffrey Smith's book, and it's called Seeds of Deception. And when I read that book and learned about some research, and we can go into that later, I had literally a light bulb pop off in my head if what I was reading was reflecting what I was seeing in kids, which was an exponential increase in illness, not only just in chronic illness, but kids who were sick more often and couldn't clear their illnesses, what, we, what I call acute on chronic. And so that began my understanding and really deep dive into understanding the literature, what was out there, and our relationship to food, which we'll go into, is not exactly what I was taught. So I had to do a paradigm shift and what I was taught in medical school and my training to what I was seeing on the front line. Quick answer. So, <laughs> I get that. That's perfect. So, um, Vince Ann, can you let us know just what does this title mean? What, what's making our children sick? Sure, yeah. Well, the subtitle sort of explains it. Um, what we are arguing in the book um, is a number of different things. First, the kind of medicine that most people are getting now for kids with chronic disorders isn't really working. And as Michelle said, this whole paradigm shift was what initially fascinated me and, and actually made me want to get involved with writing a book for her or with her, um, you know, bringing my knowledge from medical anthropology and my interest in Asian medical systems, which resonates with your training, actually, and the emphasis on food in those systems, um, but also um, sort of the bigger stories about politics and health. And when Michelle told me that she thought that genetic modification of foods was partly responsible, at least, if not largely responsible for the epidemic of chronic diseases, I thought that, I initially thought that's crazy. (laughs) Like a lot of people, I just doubted that that could be possible. And in fact, when I started to hear her tell the stories about the politics of the science on this topic, and then I started to look into it and read it myself. I really got interested, and that's partly what got me to the book project with her. Um, and I, you know, really 
um, do, when I started to put the pieces together, I realized we really do have a medical system with a lot of cracks, but we also have a food regulatory system with a lot of cracks. So you're, the title of your show, Falling to the Cracks, is perfect <laughs> for our book. It's exactly <laughs> what we talk yeah. about in the book, which is that there's this, there's this cataclysm of several things, a food regulatory system, which is full of holes and has allowed us to approve um, foods that may be a very problematic source of toxicants for our body, um, a medical system that is reluctant to deal with food in general, but particularly skeptical of the claim that GM foods could be problematic. And then we have this field of science knowledge on genetic modification of foods, which is very contested. And so that's what we try to do in the book is we try to put together the pieces that makes a coherent argument for the possibility that these foods are a root source of the problems we're seeing in our kids with this epidemic of chronic disorders. So I, I want to talk a, a, a lot more about um, just the, the the pesticides and the GMO. And, and Michelle, you know, you said you, you entered this, um, you got asked to join this group. And um, you mentioned it in the book as well. And, um, you know, you started to do the research because you weren't sure at first. So what did you find when you started to do the research on, on pesticides and what was happening there? So as has been said and mentioned, initially when I began this journey in 2006, so I've been doing it about 12 years. I, I was pra- a practicing home path since 99 and I'm an MD. But it was about 2006 that I thought when I read the book that I already mentioned and I looked at some of the original work that was done on genetic modification in Europe in, in 1996, and I began seeing some of the work of one of Dr. Arpad Pusti, and he was the first scientist to look at this process of genetic modification and whether it's safe for food and whether it should be brought into Europe. And that's already 22 years ago. So we've been doing a scientific experiment in the world, literally, for 22 years about genetically modified food. When I saw the results of his research, I thought, you know, I, it was almost incredulous, Rebecca. I said, there's no way that this can be, that he found this, and then, then this food rolled out. Because normally what happens in science is when you get a startling issue, and he found that genetic modified food was not equivalent to non-GM food, that everything halts, and there's further research that's done, the product is not brought to market, let's say, for a drug. And, but this stuff just rolled out, even despite Dr. Pusey's research, and he was fired two days after his findings were announced. I started doing some diving, and what I found was controversial. It wasn't a straight shoot because the there is so much science that is factitious, and you can excuse science to, to show whatever you want it to show, actually. Statistics are amazingly pliable, it, it, it's as shocking as that sounds. And it took a lot of digging on my part, a lot of reading. I, and I spent more time reading about pesticides and genetic modified food than I did about common pediatric issues that I'm supposed to be reading about, like asthma and, and childhood obesity and other things that I'm reading about all the time. And, and I, I've read, I don't know, maybe 1,200 articles on this topic. I've just kept reading and reading and reading and having to dig through um, what was fabricated research and what was real research. And what was very difficult for me, in all honesty, was when reading sciences, science studies was not just reading the typical going through it as, as a physician, but really understanding their methodology and really looking to what they were saying. Because even in Monsanto's research, there were problems. And I actually read the original studies that Monsanto did and their own findings don't necessarily support GMO food and what they did in their own studies. So I thought, oh, my God. So I had to go mm, deeper, way deeper than I normally might as a physician. So, did I um, your question? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I yeah, your question? Yeah, you did. Well, you know, there's, there's these arguments that, that uh, we hear in mainstream more than we hear what you're saying. You know, GMO food is going to feed the world and, and pesticides are safe to drink. And um, w- it sounds like what you were finding w- was the opposite of that. Absolutely. Right. You know, what I was finding, you know, just from the research of, not just Dr. Pusey, because his research is 20 years old, but Dr. Antonio, Dr. Seralini, Dr. Monica Kruger, um, doc, you know, there were some, Dr. Judy Carmen, um, there are people all over the world, global, it's much easier to study GM foods and pesticides, more GM food abroad, because you have to get access to the seeds, which 
you don't necessarily have access to here in the States. So a lot of the studies come out of Europe, by the way, and so there are many researchers who have been looking at this process from looking at both the GM, the genetically modified food, and those with both glyphosate, the main ingredient in Roundup, and the GM food and Roundup. If you eat a genetically modified food and, and now you're eating the food that's been modified and the pesticide, they're linked. So you're eating both. And to tease out what's causing problems is can challenging, but the original work by Dr. Pusey just looked at genetically modified food, not the pesticide, and we saw problems with it from the beginning. So um, what is the time frame that we have introduced um, uh, genetically modified foods and pesticides? Maybe, Vincent, you can talk about this. Um, it's fairly new. I mean, it's not something that was talked about, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So what what... What's the time frame that we're seeing here? Um, right. So it's a really interesting story, and I'm sure many of your listeners already know some of this story. But, you know, the genetic modification of foods was born in an era uh, just after the DDT era. And the original intention was really to try to create plants and crops um, and also products for livestock that would not require the use of so many pesticides. And over about a 20-year period, as biomedical researchers were developing transgenic um, processes for um, animal lab rats and that sort of thing, I mean, it really started in the biomedical world for, the, for use in biomedical products and my biomedical research. The plant world uh, scientists also figured out how to develop various strains of um, genetic modifications. And the first one was the Flavor Saver Tomato, which came out in the early 90s. And it was actually put through a fairly rigorous um, testing process by the FDA with lots of, of calls for intensive research on and documentation of what the transgene was, what the gene was doing and what was happening in the plants overall and whether there was going to be spread to other plants. And that a lot of that is documented in a great book by Belinda Martineau called First Fruit. Um, and what happened is as a result of that, even though in that production of data that, that the, the company called Calgene produced for the FDA, the FDA ultimately decided to approve these, even knowing there were unanswered questions, questions that people like Belinda Martineau went on to write about later with much criticism. But that process of approving that product as a food product that was genetically modified, again, using its own gene, not a different gene from another species, um, enabled there to be a sort of templating of the regulatory process for GM foods. So those that came down the pike later from companies like Monsanto um, were really just put through under the assumption that they were the same as regular foods, so generally recognized as safe and therefore not needing to go through rigorous testing procedures. And in fact, the onus for providing data on the safety of these foods was shifted almost entirely to the voluntary basis on the part of the companies that were making them. And so in about 1995-96, the first big GM crop by Monsanto was rolled out, and that was the Roundup Ready um, uh, a seed crop, uh, which is for commodity crops like soy, corn, canola. The first one was soybeans. It was originally rolled out in China and then came out in the U.S. Um, uh, later. And then um, uh, simultaneous with that, research was being done on the use of another major uh, seed crop that uses something called uh, BT, which is a pesticide. Uh, so the Roundup Ready crops are the ones that enable the crop to withstand the spraying of Roundup or any glyphosate-based herbicide. Um, and the way that it kills the plant, the way that it kills weeds, is by interrupting something called the shikimate pathway, which at the time was thought to be a great um, form of pesticide because it was thought that human cells didn't have the shikimate pathway, so it wouldn't impact them. But we now know that the microbiome has the, this, our, our bacteria in our gut do have this pathway, so there's a lot of concern about glyphosate interrupting that. The BT um, crops, and many of the commodity crops now are both BT and Roundup Ready, BT was a technology that actually turned the whole plant into an insecticide. So, again, originally the assumption was that in order for the protein that they inserted into the gene to be activated, it would need the, the high pH of the insect gut, but we now know that all the BT in these crops is pre-activated, and so there are all these questions about what's happening with this pesticide in the human gut as well. And there are some studies on this that Michelle can probably talk about. 
Um, so it's been yeah, two, two I, decades that we've had. To answer the simple question, it's been about two <laughs> decades that we've had these crops in our food system. And that's why in the book we talk about, uh, Michelle likes to say, you know, it's an, this experiment on our children uh, for the last two decades that we, you know, and actually Pusti was the first one to, to call it that, that, that experiment on the human population. We're using humans as guinea pigs. Well, it, you know, and it, it does seem that way. I mean, if you're talking about, you know, a, a food is a, a, a a pesticide. I, I mean, I understand maybe we're going to be using more pesticides, but um, my understanding is actually the opposite is happening, and um, that we're getting uh, resistant weeds and and bugs now because of our overuse of these. Is that something that you're you found in your research as well? Oh, absolutely, absolutely Rebecca, you're right on. About seventy five percent of weeds here in the U.S. are now resistant to Roundup. So companies, uh, big agribusiness, have to inc- uh, have changed the formulations, um, as well as well as the GM process to call to do some stacking of genes, and they de- develop more toxic uh, spraying and um, such as dicamba, 2,4-D. They brought back some um, formulations that we used in Vietnam, like Agent Orange, 2,3,4-T. So th- these are more toxic formulations. It's under intense litigation right now here in the U.S. because these new formulations like dicamba are having off-site um, effects on other crops. Farmers' crops are dying. It's this massive problem. So these herbicide-tolerant um, seeds that are being sprayed, the weeds have become resistant. And as Vincent already discussed with the BT process, the insects that were um, selected to you know, um, you know, die as a result of eating these pesticidal plants plants are now resistant as well as the corn borer and other other worms. And so we have this massive problem of now getting into a chemical tread we- treadmill, so to speak, or a hamster wheel, where we now are in a chemical circle of having to create more and more stacked genes and new genetic modification techniques are now in, in the you know, coming up, um, as we can talk about if you like, like CRISPR technology and such, and more toxic formulations. So things are not necessarily getting better, they're actually getting worse. So to understand that this process that was supposed to use less chemicals and improve our food supply has done neither. Mm. Well, you know, this is... um Something I'm glad we're bringing attention to it, um, and we're going to talk about what this means for our children and actually for ourselves um, when we get back after this break. Today we're talking with Michelle Perro and Vince Ann Adams, and we're discussing their book, What's Making Our Children Sick. We'll be back shortly. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. The largest syndicated alternative health talk program has come to the Voice America Network. The Dr. Bob Martin Show is the program that will answer your health questions and help you to heal your own body of many different ailments. Each week, you'll hear the answers that Dr. Bob gives to his callers that help them to be their own doctor most of the time. We'll also discuss developments on the health care front and what you need to do to keep your body in top form. The Dr. Bob Martin Show airs Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health & Wellness. The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single-day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480-294-294. 6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com. Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480 294 6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com. Voice America is where you are and where you want to be. Join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available. Don't forget to view all our live events, including on demand access to past events that you may have missed, by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness.
You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Riss. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Riss. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Michelle Perro and Vince Ann Adams. We're discussing their book, What's Making Our Children Sick? How Industrial Food is Causing an Epidemic of Chronic Illness and What Parents and Doctors Can Do About It. So, um, Vince Ann, maybe you can just tell us what, uh, you know, are our children sick? What's actually going on? Well, it's kind of a shock, actually. When I first heard Michelle talk about an epidemic, I thought, no, no, our kids are healthier than ever. And I, you know, honestly, I spent many years working in uh, very poor resource underdeveloped countries and boy, lots of kids are sick in those places. But when she started listing the things that she was seeing in her clinical care, food allergies, asthma, eczema, Crohn's disease, colitis, reflux, IBDs and IBS, type 2 diabetes, obesity, autism, ADHD, depression, I mean, the gamut and then we started, she started saying, yeah, they're all on the rise. And it's true. They're all on the rise. They're up by sometimes double the rates over the last 10 years to 15 years. And um, I realized, my gosh, it's true. These kids really are sick and they're really falling through the cracks of conventional medical care. What we did when we wrote the book is we went and interviewed a lot of her because I really wanted to get a hands-on feeling for what she was talking about and, and figure out what the stories were on the part of the families. And again and again, what we kept hearing is our kids are sick. The doctors keep giving us the equivalent of Band-Aids. They're giving us steroids, topical creams. They're giving us analgesics and antihistamines, but they're not giving us cures. And we want to get to the root cause of these disorders. And... Um, I mean, I have to say that that alone would have made a good book even before we got to the food <laughs> problem. But as Michelle points out, it is partly the food, it's not, if not largely the food, that may be the root cause of these disorders. So I'm going to let Michelle talk a little bit about the syndromes that we talk about in the book that make the connections between uh, toxicants and, and exposure to toxicants. And I, I will say, you know, our kids are exposed to a lot of things in the environment, not just food toxicity. I mean, they're exposed to lots of PCBs, daylights, you know, endocrine disruption. Um, there are a lot of toxicants in the environment, and these also surely play a role. But what Michelle was really focusing in on are these kinds of syndromes and um, theories about failure, systemic failure in the body that aren't really well known in regular medicine, but that kind of explain a lot of a lot of the chronic disorders that start with things like, you know, leaky gut, dysbiosis, and then immune system. But I'll let Michelle explain those because she's the expert on that. <laughs> sure. Go ahead, Michelle. I think, and Dan, you've done a great job. This is so good. Um, <laughs> so as we've, as we've already established, the majority of illnesses are on the rise from everything from the most minor of illnesses from frequent frequent infections to m more concerning illnesses like asthma allergies eczema to even gut, gut disruptions and leaky gut and abnormal um, microbes that we can get into with you Rebecca as well to more systemic and concerning disorders like autoimmunity which is profound and on the rise as Vassan already mentioned to the neurocognitive disorders, which include the autism, the ADHD, sensory processing, the learning disorders, which didn't even exist and don't even have representation in pediatric textbooks, many of these disorders that we're seeing, such, such as some of the processing disorders. The, and some of these very um, kind, not only, we, we now are call, calling autism a spectrum because there are so many types of issues that we're seeing, you can't even catalog them all. Kids who are floppy, we call that hypotonia, with low muscle tone, or hypersensitive, or have extreme car sickness, and that is a vestibular um, issue, that thing, on to cancers. Now, cancers are rising slowly because it takes a long time for cancer to develop, but compared to 40 to 50 years ago, there's a 50% increase in cancers, with leukemia being one, brain tumors being two, 
And the leukemias are definitely, definitely linked in the research. Super good science on that by a, a nice researcher, Dr. Herbert Hertz um, uh, Picciolotto, on paternal exposures as well, mostly to chemicals and pesticides, not just mom, by the way, mom and dad. So you've got this array of increasing disorders as we define epidemic proportions with the definition of epidemic is under 1 in 100. Autism now affects 1 in 68 children, 1 in 43 boys, and is increasing in the U.S. Um, so there is that's the palette of our changing children's health. When we as integrative docs, and you being one of them, you know we have to get to the root cause. This mm-hmm. is not the training of Western physicians. And when you get to the root cause, it begins in the gut. Immune function, production of the chemicals that run your brain called neurotransmitters, the home of your microbiome, the, those organisms that we can get into, what they do, uh, as well as detoxification, all is in the gut. So if the gut is off, for whatever reason, systems start to break down. So, um, you know, I've, I've definitely seen this um, happen as well in practice. I mean, you get children who are, um, they have eczema, asthma, allergies. And, um, you know, in your book, I was, uh, you know, reading the statistics, which I've read before, but always shocks me. I mean, uh, how much that has increased just over a short period of time. And there doesn't seem to be, you know, alarm bells going off about w- what's happening in our in our world. I mean, there are very low level, you know, we're talking about it, but, um, you know, I, I think we, we should really be paying more attention um, to, to what's happening and, and seeing that this is different than it used to be. Indeed. And you know, what's interesting in my world, because I talk to a lot of families and I deal with a lot of moms in particular, and it seems that, and I've looked at this and, and thought about this so many times, that there's a parallel universe occurring. That in Western health, the alarm bells, as you point out, are not ringing, and we can go into why that is, why Western doctors are not running with this and screaming at the hilltops. This is this is shocking. However, moms particularly, and um, dads too, but a lot of moms, are taking the matters into their own hands. And they're starting to get the care through integrative practitioners and doing their own homework and own, own research. You can just Google this stuff. Dr. Google lays it out for you, what can be going on. So they're, they're Googling it. Moms sometimes know more about a topic than I do. They've done so much research. And, and not only are these moms kind of changing the conversation, and this is particularly true, let's say, with the field of autism. Many of these women have changed a treatment, and, and autistic kids get better, by the way. It's not happening in the Western medical clinics, but it's happening in the parallel universe of the women's world and how women network. So there's this whole thing going on. And women, you can go Google this, are offering all kinds of treatments that people can buy online and get for their children. So we're witnessing in front of us a very interesting phenomenon of how people are circuiting the Western medical system. I find it fascinating. Well, I actually, this came up um, last week, actually, it was uh, with somebody who had uh, suffered chronic fatigue, and um, she said that the people with chronic fatigue understand more about what's going on than the doctors, because, you know, they're getting ignored, and, and you know, as you said, band-aids, and, you know, just live with it, is what a lot of people are told, and especially with the eczema, asthma, and the allergies, just live with the allergies, that's what, you know, maybe you'll grow out of it, um, but, you know, that that's heartbreaking for for most parents because they don't want their child to just grow out of it. They want them to, to feel comfortable and, and to, um, you know, have a normal childhood without a huge amount of illness. And and remember this, Rebecca, it's important for your listeners. When you have a child who's chronically ill in the family, whether it's autism, chronic eczema, which can be very disruptive, a sleep disorder, it disrupts the entire family function. The whole family is stressed. And you can't undervalue the role of chronic stress and sleep deprivation on a family because stress alone can cause significant health changes because it affects not only um, something called your cortisol, which upregulates inflammation, but it also can change your epigenetics. And if mom is chronically stressed because she's sleep deprived um, and, and, and that gets passed on to the infant, those stressors can change your epigenetics as well, which then can lead to disease later, such as cardiovascular disease and autoimmunity and even cancer. So just the stress alone that chronic illness can produce can't be ignored. And that, too, is a factor in this whole equation. I mean, I know we're talking about our book today on food, 
But this is also important and because it's holistic, right? We have to look at the entire system and all this is affected. So I, t- I take that into account with my families as well, the stressors that are produced by chronic illness. Well, you know, I, I agree with you, and I think food is a, a and and the gut is a first place to start. And and um, but of course, when we're looking at a holistic health, we're looking at the whole, and um, we can't ignore any part of what can be causing the illness. But um, you know, you you both have mentioned the microbiome. Um, maybe Vincent, you can let us know what that is and why it's so important. Uh, sure. Um, so you know, we now know that the human being is made up of not just human cells, but anywhere from 10 to 90 percent uh, um, times the number of human cells, uh, bacterial cells. So they're on the surface of the skin, they're in the nasal passages, they're in the digestive tract. And that's the one that's the most interesting to us. And really the research on this, you know, we've known about it for a long time, but the research on it is just exploding now. And um, what we're starting to learn and what we talk about in the book is the possibility that, um, as Michelle said, a lot of these disorders that we're seeing systemically in the body are starting in the gut when the microbes in the gut get disrupted, creating what's called dysbiosis, so an unhealthy relationship of bad bacteria to good bacteria. Good bacteria are important because they enable you to digest your food and get your nutrients out of it. They play a role in producing amino acids that are used in the rest of the body's systems. They make for a healthy immune system, et cetera, et cetera. So um, one of the things that we look at in the book is what happens when you have an impacted gut is the possibility of something called leaky gut. And uh, this is kind of a controversial area, um, but it's there are some researchers, for example, there's one guy at Harvard who's been working on this named Fasano, who has been arguing that when you have um, uh, raw patches in your immune system, for whatever reason, um, you can get this extra permeability in the lining of the gut, the villi that are supposed to absorb nutrients out of the food have extra large gaps or gaps that stay open for too long, letting too many things pass into the bloodstream, which triggers an immune response. And um, in the book, we talk about this low-grade chronic inflammation that starts up, which can, you know, of course, be related to a lot of the chronic problems. So we do think that the gut is the key, and the microbiome and the research on the microbiome, which we now know the microbiome can be changed somewhat significantly, not entirely, within just a few days based on what you're eating. Um, uh, We know that the microbiome is kind of the key ingredient in putting together or the key piece of the puzzle that enables us to connect toxicants in the food with chronic health disorders. Um, and it is, I just want to go back to this conversation about the medical system. You know, it, it is a curious thing that we don't spend, that, that doctors aren't taught more about food. Um, you know, they're, of course, they're taught about nutrition uh, and diet to some extent. It's, it's a very small part of the curriculum usually. Um, and, and I will say, you know, there are, good, there are reasons for this. I mean, doctors have a really hard time getting people to change their diet um, and their behavior in general. And for at least, you know, a hundred years now, we've been really relying on this rise of pharmaceutical products to cure problems. And um, it's easier to put a pill, to throw a pill at something than it is to get people to change their behavior. And so it's become much more normal for doctors to think about what medicine they can give for something, even if it's palliative, I mean, even if it's just treating the symptom rather than the cause, than to actually dig in and figure out what's going wrong with diet or what role diet has in uh, the patient's disorder. And what really shocked me when I started to look at what Michelle was doing was, you know, she has their, her patients keeping food diaries to figure out what kinds of things they're sensitive to, not just allergic to, but what are they having an immune response to. Um, she does all these panels, blood, urine, um, uh, microbiome fecal tests to see what's going on in the kid's gut and what kind of toxicants they have in their system. And that was really unusual to have patients really, um, uh, you know, being diagnosed by way of the things they're putting in their body, right? And so, um, you know, this is like, this is something that doctors need to start paying attention to. And of course, it takes years for doctors to change their patterns as well. And they, they don't change them because 
they have, you know, the standard clinical guidelines are based on evidence-based medicine and that kind of thing. So, you know, in some ways, doctors aren't being taught enough, fast enough about food. And, and they still don't have a repertoire for understanding how food is causing problems. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure that that they do. I mean, I don't think their training is enough. And and you know, I've I had a patient with uh, colitis who was told that this what he considered the strict diet she was on, which was removing um, grains, dairy, and and sugar, was uh, too hard of a life to to live. It was and she was symptom free, and she thought, well, this is better than you know all the, what was going on before. And he said, I want you to eat the food, and I'll just give you steroids to control the symptoms instead right oh and, and you know it, story. She, i spent argued, two hours with a patient once getting them off white bread and white rice with um ulcerative colitis sent the, that, that kid to the pediatric gastroenterologist and said that is the biggest bunch of nonsense that she's ever heard white food has nothing to do with ulcerative colitis have the kid eat what he wants and and yeah. the, changing the kid's diet was a first step in getting this kid better. Ulcerative colitis takes a lot to get a kid better. But boy, just changing foods helped his symptoms. And we talk about this one child in the book. So it's amazing, this disconnect. And I actually have been talking to colleagues because I do work in a Western medical clinic, traditional urgent care where, you know, I'm trained in acute medicine. And I've asked doctors, why? why what's going on with you? And anecdotally, what they say is, it's just not the way we're trained. We don't have the knowledge. We don't know what to do. So they, their training is so rigorous in pharmaceuticals. Remember, med school, we get a year of pharmacology. And I personally got two weeks of dietary medicine, not nutrition. There's a difference. And so there's a lack of training. And people like myself, I went to school online at night when my kids were little with a full-time practice. It's really hard to retrain yourself. And in essence, what I've done is I've trained myself to become a naturopath, in, in essence, and a functional medicine practitioner is what we call it. But that's the training you have to do. And it often occurs on your own once you've done all the Western training. But you can't negate that Western training. It's fabulous as a platform. And if healthcare providers can then use that platform to embrace these other techniques, we can get our children better. So that's a positive note. I kind of would jump into the end here, and I don't want to, you know, shortchange this conversation. But, you know, this is possible. And you can you can build on your knowledge, and you can make changes. It's doable, and it's possible. I, I definitely agree with you. Um, it's a good place to take a break, so we're going to do that. We're talking today with Michelle Perro and Vince Ann Adams, and we'll be back shortly. Take us on the go. It's even easier now. The Voice America Talk Radio Network has launched our mobile app for iPhone, Android, or BlackBerry. Visit the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market to download the app powered by Aircast. It's free and no registration is necessary. In minutes, you could be enjoying your favorite Voice America Talk Radio host, no matter where you are, in the car, out and about, while traveling, or anytime you can't be close to your computer. Catch up on the archives you've missed or discover new shows on the spot. Search Voice America at your favorite app store. What causes us to be sick? We're not talking about the actual illness or the scientific cause of illnesses. We're talking about your body and health. Listen for the healing whisper of Return to Peace. Each week, host Dr. Marianne Chase shows you how to listen to your heart to identify poor health, stress, and disease. You'll learn how to heal energetically and spiritually as well as physically. It's time to depend less on the drugs and more on the heart. The Healing Whisper airs live every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health and Wellness. Follow the Voice America Talk Radio Network on Twitter. We're at Voice America TRN. You'll get the latest fix on what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and general happenings that you should know about at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. Now you don't have to miss anything when you're away from your home or office. Just go to twitter.com forward slash Voice America TRN or follow along with us at Voice America TRN. The Voice America Talk Radio Network. We're on the cutting edge of social media. Can you keep up? Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness. You 
are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Michelle Perro and Vince Ann Adams, and we're discussing their book, What's Making Our Children Sick? How Industrial Food is Causing an Epidemic of Chronic Illness and What Parents and Doctors Can Do About It. So, Vince Ann, would you be able to tell us, uh, I mean, we've talked a little bit about this, but the, the term industrial food, what does that mean? Uh, good question. So, we use the term industrial food to mean really what is truly modern food. Um, you know, agriculture has been remaking food for millennia. Um, you know, ever since the dawn of time, men have been people have been changing and breeding and cultivating and improving crops and that sort of thing, and uh, even hybridizing crops. But there was a radical shift in the way we um, grew our food in the post-World War II era, when chemical companies started to get much more involved in the production of food and figured out a way to make petrochemicals uh, a main ingredient in growing food. And, and so this was the beginning of the use of, uh, again, the post-EDT era, figuring out how to modify our food so that they could withstand the spraying of, of petrochemical pesticides and the creation of crops that could be genetically modified for specific traits. Um, and there's a lot of talk you often hear and push back um, against people who are concerned about GMOs that this is just another way of doing, of improving on traditional breeding. And it absolutely is not. And there are many arguments out there uh, to show why it is not. Um, and uh, one of the main reasons is that the, the technologies that are used um, create the possibility of different kinds of and random uh, proteins that are expressed in the plants, many of which, again, have never been tested and certainly never tested on humans. And again, the regulatory process, we talked about this at the beginning of the show, the regulatory process that approved them was quite hasty. Um, And so when we talk about industrial foods, we're talking about foods that are grown with the use of genetic modification in order to maximize the use of um, or in order to be used with, not to maximize, it was initially done to minimize, but to be grown with uh, chemical products that are now uh, necessary for growing plants. So one of the things that we talk about in the book is the way that the soil is also impacted by the use of of the growth of genetic modification. Soils need more fertilizers, more chemical fertilizers to replenish what's being taken away by the use of harsh pesticides. So farmers now on the main commodity crops, and these are, again, soy, corn, canola, sugar beets, and cotton, um, and then, of course, wheat is not genetically modified, but it, it does apparently uh, is being grown with a huge amount of glyphosate at the very end of the cycle before harvesting. And glyphosate, again, is the main ingredient in Roundup. Um, we, foods, industrial foods are grown with lots, lots and lots of massive um, use of seeds that are genetically modified, pesticides that are designed to be used with those seeds, and fertilizers that have to be put in. So it's the opposite of organic farming. Now, organic farming takes a lot of inputs, but there are a lot of people out there doing organic farming without the harsh chemicals. So these are the foods we're talking about that have been now, have become a major part of our um, our food supply system, especially the things that are coming in packaged form that Michael Pollan talks about that have a lot of soy, corn, canola uh, in them or sugar from sugar beets that have a lot of genetic modification. But beyond those packaged foods, we're also worried about the real foods. Now, there are many other genetically modified foods on the market other than those that we've talked about, the commodity crops. There are these enhancements that are used. Um, and so unless one is eating organic, there's a good chance that one is eating genetically modified foods these days. So um, 
Michelle, when when you um, have a patient come to you in your clinic and knowing all of this about food, and it it sounds like you know this is your first approach um, is to work you know with the gut and changing the diet. Um, what what do you talk to people about? How do you explain this, and how do you get them started in making changes? Well, um, this is another good question, Rebecca, because the people who come to see me tend to have kids who are chronically ill. And they've usually the ones who have already um, gone to the usual host of medical practitioners and have come up with a lot of dead ends. And oftentimes the families are desperate. Here in our county where we live in Northern California, I tend to see mostly women bringing their kids in, and the kids have the chronic array of illnesses we've already covered in the beginning of the show. So they're very willing to make change. This is not the reluctant type of person. And because kids are so sick, up all night, missing school, not feeling well, having mood disorders. Remember, the gut and the brain are connected, leaky gut, leaky brain. So kids often don't feel well, don't behave well. They're cranky, they're tired, they're having tantruming, um, they're having meltdowns, they can't attend birthday parties. So the parents are really quite eager to make changes. So when you know, I've been doing this so long and I've treated so many thousands of kids that kids can literally walk in the door these days and I can almost see what's going on because I can look at them and see the nutritional deficiencies and the gut disorder just by looking at them, Rebecca. This stuff is not subtle. By looking at their hair, the dark circles under their eyes, tongue findings, nail findings, bloated tummies, pallor, skin changes, low muscle tone. I mean, and not all kids have all these findings. You know, every kid is an individual. Some have very very few. Some have more. So there's an array of clinical findings that you'll see, and that's just by walking in the door. So what I tell the, the families and often the moms, as I've said, is that, okay, we have to start with our food. If parents are unwilling for any reason, I'll say, you just make these switches of organic food and see how it goes. But you can't just, like, change breakfast. There has to be a willingness of the family to make the changes. It's not fair for little Johnny to have to eat your kale salad and little Susie snarfing down a pepperoni pizza. It doesn't work that way. So the whole family has to embrace the change to support the child that's ill. And it may not be a mom could have five kids and only one is sick. It may not be all of them, which is another interesting thing about sick children. It's often the first kid who's the sickest if mom has more than one kid. So the family has to embrace a change. And if they're not going to go organic, I usually tell the family, I can give you my best herbs, supplements, remedies, whatever, but the changes will not be sustained. You may see some initial changes with a good homeopathic remedy or some herbs or some methyl B12, but if you don't change their diet, it won't be sustained. So I start with 100% organic food. And this also means, as Vincent already beautifully pointed out, the processed foods have to go. You have to cook, and that means everyone in the kitchen. So there's a cultural change. And I'm not just talking about mom in the kitchen, okay? This is not to make mom's job harder. Everyone in the kitchen. Once kids are five years old, even three, they can get in the kitchen and start some basic cooking techniques. This is a wonderful life skill that parents can teach their kids is how to cook. I have moms who said, I don't know how to cook. I say, perfect, go on YouTube. You can learn anything on YouTube. You can mm-hmm. learn how to like, make your most basic food. So it starts with the food, organic food. And then I take it from there. I'll often pull off gluten, soy, dairy, And then I start layering in treatments depending on their kid, any lab work I get, and their finances. Many of these these testing that Vincent alluded to earlier are not covered by traditional insurances and parents have have to pay out of pocket. So our goal is not to bankrupt families. What am I doing? So if a family says, I can't afford this testing, we can treat without it. If they say, I can't afford these supplements that you're recommending, we can... Oh, use food as medicine. I think Hippocrates said that. I can't take credit mm-hmm. for that one. <laughs> no. <laughs> there are things you can do that are beautiful, sustainable, and even almost affordable. Yes. Well, you know, I I, I always love the idea of, of food as medicine because it really is. And, and you know, food is also a, a cause of illness if, if we're taking it the wrong way. And um, I know that there are probably people listening that don't want to give up their, you know, blank, their um, their chai latte every day or their um, whatever it is. But, um, you know, in making the decision to be well, because I've been through this, you know, when I was 21, that was the first step in 
in my journey. Um, it's at, eventually through chronic Lyme, but everybody said, well, this is your gut. You've got to start there. And, and I was very resistant at first. I love my bread. I love my milk. But then I felt better. And to me, that that was worth it because by changing how I ate, my life quality was so much better. As a practitioner with you walking the walk, I've been down that journey myself, changing my own diet, and I tell my patients, I do what I tell you to do. I walk the walk. I've done it myself. I follow a paleo-keto diet myself, and we can go into various diets. I often prescribe paleo-type eating to a lot of kids, especially with neurocognitive disorders. Um, and or ketogenic or variations of GAPS diets, and I give them books to read, videos to watch, YouTube, etc., that I said, see it for yourself. Don't believe me, and don't believe in sand. Do it yourself at home, and please, if you can, I tell parents, give it four weeks. They will often see changes in three days. The sicker the kid, the quicker the change they'll see, by the way. Now, the mm-hmm. thing you have to remember about children, especially kids on the spectrum or neurocognitive disorders, is that they're very picky eaters, extremely picky And they're often picky eaters because they have nutrient deficiencies like zinc and other things which make you pickier. So to get those kids to embrace these food changes can be challenging. So I tell parents, it takes time. It can be a rocky road. Don't give up. You know, and I give them little tricks on how to kids to get to eat, to eat those foods and get them off the five white food diet, as I, like as I've read about, or as we call it, you know, the white bread, white rice, you know, chicken nuggets kind of diet. Mm-hmm. And it takes time. And that there's not a straight shoot. So kids don't get better like an arrow straightening up. There are a lot of ups and downs. As kids get sick, they can relapse and they get better again. There will be challenges. Grandma can try and sabotage it and slipping cupcakes in when the kid's not, when you're not looking. All kinds of sabotages for well-meaning families. So be patient. Don't expect miracles and, and just give it at least four weeks. And they and families themselves will see the changes. Well, that, that's, you know, really encouraging to know. And I think, um, you know, there is an underground movement to um, make good food more available. And and I think, um, you know, especially if anybody's thinking, what would I eat if I remove those things? It's definitely important to assess what your diet is like now and maybe make some changes. Um, because if, if you're only eating the white stuff, <laughs> then, you know, y- you need a rainbow to be healthy. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we spend a lot of time on this in the book. At the end of the book, we talk about how this really isn't just a question of individual choice and, and individual behavior. You know, it's a public health problem, actually. I mean, many people live in food deserts. They don't have access to organic food, or the organic food costs way too much money. So we really, at the end of the book, we talk about needing to change things on a societal level. We need to think about what it would mean. Just imagine for a minute what it would be like to have our food subsidies going to organic farmers instead of to GM commodity crop producers. It would be amazing to think about what changes might be possible on that front and to really, you know, support the local food movement, to support the urban garden movement. All of these things are happening, and we just want to endorse all of that. But we also talk about how we need to change things in medicine. Um, and we, we propose this idea of eco-medicine it's being tossed around by uh, several pe- several different groups right now. Um, but to really promote a model of medicine that takes seriously the relationship between soil health and gut health. Um, mm-hmm. And, of course, good food is the passage point between those two things. And so and we really pay attention to that. We also call attention to the incredible parents, and particularly, as Michelle said, moms, who, through their personal journeys in trying to help their kids, have decided to get involved not just to uh, help their kids and their families, but to actually change their communities. So lots of groups who have done anti-pesticide spraying in their neighborhoods, who have gotten on board with the label GM uh, campaigns, and, you know, we really applaud them and and talk about how we really we need to respect and um, applaud them rather than, Uh, criticize them as being, um, you know, conspiracy theorists. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I definitely agree. Um, I I think we could uh, keep talking, but unfortunately, we only had an hour today. So um, is there any way that someone can get a hold of you or your book um, if they want more information? Um, Absolutely. They can buy it through our publisher, Chelsea Green. They can buy it on Amazon. Local bookstores are now um, um, having the book in stock, and they can read it there. 
And if they want to reach me, um, I'm an executive director of GMOScience.org, a nonprofit website dedicated to bringing the science and health interface together. And they can reach me at Michelle at GMOScience.org. Uh, and they can reach me through my university affiliation. And they can get information on that on the website for the book. Okay, perfect. So today we were speaking with Michelle Perro and Vincent Adams. We were discussing their book, What's Making Our Children Sick? How Industrial Food is Causing an Epidemic of Chronic Illness and What Parents and Doctors Can Do About It. I want to thank everybody for listening today. Just be sure to make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week.